I went into Sherwin Williams to look for a paint color and I discovered that there are now paint palette colors for each Enneagram type. And so I think to myself, oh no. Why would I have to think about the color of my house if my personality can do it for me? Yeah. We need emotional intelligence more than ever. And, and I dare say beyond emotional intelligence, what we need is emotional responsibility. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking part in this immersive listening experience. A meaningful existence is a moving target that no matter how close, will always be out of reach. We hope this message finds you with an outstretched hand. As we attempt to uncover complex truths, remember, life's toughest questions can be answered if we all just focus on one thing. Being good people. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Good People, episode 45. Today, I was joined by Maria Candler. She has been helping lead teams and coach people in the business environment as an Enneagram coach for over 25 years. In today's episode, I talked with Maria about what the Enneagram is, the three centers of intelligence of the Enneagram, what wing types are, what security and stress types are, and the importance of uncovering characteristics of your personality. If you guys are watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss our weekly uploads. Enjoy the show. All right. Well, Maria, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Before we jump into our topic, uh, I should say I'm very excited uh, about this. I've done Enneagram stuff in the past. I've just never really done like a deep dive into what it is and how it works. And so um, it's all I can think about over the last like week. And so I'm very uh, excited to to talk to you, ask questions about it. But um, I think your your knowledge and work with it will be a very interesting episode. Great. Yeah. Excited to have the conversation. Can you get us started with a brief overview of what it is that you do and the kind of work that you do? Right. Um, so I'm in sort of the second season of my professional life and just following the threads on where I think the universe is trying to send me. But I, um, for many years, um, ran a corporation and um, probably as a result of the Enneagram and some of the things that I was uncovering about myself in the process, um, decided to leave corporate America and sort of that grind life and um, just take some time to figure out what the next steps were for me. And that led me on a journey of, of continuing to work with the Enneagram and to incorporate that in a coaching practice where I also do um, focus on uh, work in trauma and just helping people, you know, wherever they're showing up uh, with whatever they're bringing in. So um, that is my... Uh, my current program, and um, it's just been a, a really exciting journey just to kind of get to that that place. So, yeah, very good. I'm ex I'm interested personally what it was about the Enneagram that sort of shift made this big shift for you. Yeah, well, admittedly, um, I was a skeptic at first. It was brought into my corporation, and um, well, this might give away my Enneagram type, but my my company's culture was definitely one of continuous improvement. Um, we were always t you know, tinkering and, and tweaking and um, always very passionate about having a, a development plan for all of our staff. So we had tried many different typology programs um, and normally they were interesting. They ended, be, ended up being like just a really uncanny, accurate description of the way people behaved. Um, but inevitably made their way into the filing cabinet, never to be seen or heard from again, and sort of like the flavor of the month, I guess you could say. So um, I had brought in some consultants for something completely unrelated, probably, you know, re-engineering re our sales process or something like that. And they mentioned this program. And I, I, I think my initial reaction was like, oh, we tried so many of those things, you know, it's just what's one more. Um, but they convinced me. And we gave it a try, and I was really um, surprised by this approach. Uh, it was very different than anything we had tried before. And um, what really got me was we had a, uh, we used to have like an annual family fun day where we'd invite the families of all of our employees to come and we'd play all day. And I had a wife of one of my employees 
that approached me and she said, Hey, you know, that thing that you guys are doing, the Enneagram, I'm pretty sure that that's going to save my marriage. And I was shocked. Um, I was shocked because of what that meant for her. And also because it was really in parallel to just the changes that I was seeing on my side personally, as I started to take the work more seriously and uncover. So it really became a, a, an instrumental part of our um, employee offering. And, you know, my passion for it just continued to grow the more I studied and the more I, I looked at myself and asked the hard questions. So. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting you say that because in the last week I, uh, I retook the test. I obviously have looked a lot into what the Enneagram is in preparation for chatting with you. My fiance has also taken the test and I cannot remember the resource that we used, but it is, it basically, you just put in your type and your partner's type or whatever the, that may be. And, um, it pretty much gives you like the, the positives and negatives of, of being in a relationship or whatever with, with this type of person. And I was reading it and it was very bizarre how on point it was describing some of the interactions that her and I have with each other when, you know, it, it would describe, this is, this is the positive of your types being together. And here might be some of the drawbacks. And literally I was reading the positives and I was like, kind of tearing up because it was sort of <laughs> an emotional thing of like, this is what I like about our relationship that we're like this. And so um, I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you about some of the implications of, of these things from a business perspective and a relational perspective. Um, but let's start with what it is that any, the Enneagram actually is. Right. Yeah. So I think on, you know, 30,000 view, it is a typology system uh, on the surface and it does um, point us to nine different types. Um, and it really, um, I think what's so different about it is that, and I'll reference back to what I said about other programs describing our behavior, but the Enneagram really invites us to go much deeper than our behaviors and to uncover our motivations you know, why we do the things we do, why we get caught in some of the thoughts that we get caught in, um, explain some of our, you know, sort of natural feeling states too. And so, um, you know, where growth is concerned, unless you're really coming to your internal why, it's very hard to do anything with it. And I think that's why other programs inevitably ended in the file cabinet. But this one um, really offered a uh, an opportunity, a map, if you will, to grow out of some of those things once you start that slow uncovering of things. Hmm. How was it developed? Do you know? <clears throat> so that's a bit of a mystery. Um, and some of the earliest origins of the Enneagram, more from like the symbol of it, um, could go as far back as like 200 CE. So kind of ancient in its origin. Um, we started to see a, a more modern version of it in the 20s um, to start with um, George Gurdjieff, um, who really pulled it in and started to consider it from a philosophical uh, use, more like the three centers of intelligence. And then that ma then made its way over to um, Oscar Achazo, where it was really um, embraced as more of a spiritual tool and then just further developed. And then that leads us to, I think, a very important moment of intersection where psychology and spirituality converge with Claudio Naranjo, who is a psychologist that um, spent some time at Berkeley, where this system really got um, taken apart and really good work was done with some of the, the teachers that we now recognize that are still to this day continuing to work with the system. And I think we're also actually on another important um, intersection where the Enneagram is now uh, being worked on uh, by Dan Siegel in his work in interpersonal neurobiology. Are you familiar with Dan Siegel? Yeah. When really, I talked to uh, Linda Hancock, we talked about, she said Dan Siegel was her yeah. research crush. Yes. Yes. She has several <laughs> research crushes. Yeah, I get that. Um, but he, um, he is doing really amazing work where um, it's, uh, I think, developmental pathways where, you know, we, we kind of are born with a temperament that you know, we're born into a holding environment, uh, you know, our early origins, even if we have great loving parents, you know, things don't always go great. Um, and so it's a little bit of like temperament 
meets attachment theory and then how our personalities develop um, with, you know, uh, the neurobiology involved. So it's very exciting because he actually has really used the Enneagram as his model and put a lot of good science to it. Um, one of the challenges that, you know, as an Enneagram teacher, you know, as an example, I, I went into Sherwin Williams to look for a paint color not that long ago, and I discovered that there are now uh, paint palette colors for each Enneagram type. And so I think to myself, oh, no, <laughs> this is no good. Um, and as it turns out, my types, I didn't like any of the colors. So I don't know where that came from. But anyway, you know, it is... Um, I think in its popularity, it has uh, kind of skirted over into the, you know, the entertainment area, and uh, that's unfortunate. So I do hope that Dan Siegel's work will bring us back to uh, the legitimacy that I think it, it deserves as a as a model for growth. Yeah, I, I would even say too that might be a testament of its popularity. Where uh, you know what you're talking about is very. This world is so fascinating to me, where it seems like a lot of the the Eastern practices or spiritual world meets Western science is a, it yeah. seems like a very cool place to be right now because it, we, a lot of people are uncovering that these two things are not different. And, and mm. whether you are talking about, you know, tissue in the brain or areas of the brain responding to certain stimulus or just some far fetched, like you said, when you first stumbled upon the Enneagram idea it seems like these two things are are sort of happening at the same time. And, yeah. I, you know, when you describe the paint color thing, it made me think of uh, astrology. And it's it, a lot of those things are very fascinating to read about. And it, no doubt uh, human beings since the dawn of man have been marveling at the stars and wondering, you know, what these things are made of and how they impact our lives. And at some level, it probably does affect the people that we are. But um, because of the popularity and the the lack, I guess, of um, thoughtful mind towards some of the whys behind some of these things, I think you do end up getting certain areas of these uh, things where, you know, whatever your personality should depict the color that you paint your house or whatever the case may be, you know, it, it's all, it's all fun, but uh, I think that's just part of, of a growing, uh, getting eyes on it. Yeah. Yeah. And our tendency to want to label things, you know, which is, which is definitely, uh, definitely shows up. So. Yeah. Why, why would I have to think about the color of my house if my personality can do it for me? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, exactly. Why do you think it's important for people to understand what their type is? Well, I, um, gosh, I, I look out at the world right now and I think we're living in an era where uh, we need emotional intelligence more than ever. And, and I dare say beyond emotional intelligence, what we need is emotional responsibility. And so this is, um, there, are, there are many ways to build your emotional intelligence, and you need to find what works best for you. But this for me has been, um, I, I just have not found a better program for um, working with emotions, understanding my emotions, understanding um, the way that I'm showing up in the world, but also giving, um, giving some natural resource points to start to work with that. So um, I, you know, I, I know that you in life have navigated enough to, to know there are a lot of people you encounter that are like, you know, I'm good. Everybody else are the ones with the problems. I'm good. Mm. And, you know, we have a lot of that. And I think we're all paying a price for that. So I, I believe that in order to um, navigate successfully with a joyful life that is full of good things, that we need to check ourselves first. And if we're all checking ourselves first, I mean, imagine what that world would look like right now. So, you know, I think that, I mean, there are so many gifts in the Enneagram, but I think the invitation to work with all parts of yourself to un understand and uncover uh, is really just the, one of the best gifts. It sounds like underlying that too, obviously, you know, to look inward and understand yourself, the good and the bad. I think there's also this idea, and, and correct me if I'm wrong in assuming this, but understanding the Enneagram in its entirety is also 
in a way an empathetic act because yes instead of just like for example i'll I'll say that like i'm a type one um Mm. on the enneagram hardcore type one i don't understand when people don't want to optimize everything in their life it makes no sense to me you know like i could tell you where my screwdriver is in my in my toolbox in my garage like it's the top right little drawer you know i know where it is um but it's i think equally if not more important um to because i know that number one see where i might falter but also if i know what other types of people exist and again i know this might not be all encompassing there's there's so many variables right but if i know the other kinds of types of personalities out there when i'm engaging in the world it it's easier for me to go oh this person doesn't think like me or or this person doesn't value knowing where their screwdriver is in their in their toolbox or whatever the case may be it sounds like right. there's a bit of that yeah for sure for sure and so as a, a fellow type 1 i i can relate to knowing where everything is um and you know so there yeah there is um there is an invitation to under our, understand ourselves, but also in working with all the other types, we start to see a little bit of ourself in all of the types. Sometimes we see it as a trigger and we have so much to learn when we are triggered by something that happens with another person. I mean, that is really a great opportunity for a mirror, but if you have that sort of dug in defended position of like, no, it's, it's them, but it, it, it often is not the case. So Um, so I do want to, if you don't mind back up, because I think, you know, you, you took an assessment and that is perfectly fine. And many people, that is their point of entry. Um, tests, assessments can be, uh, very inaccurate. Um, a lot of times, uh, people will fill out the information just based on maybe a situation that they're in, in the moment. Um, maybe they're filling it out from a, an aspirational perspective, like this is how I really want to be. I mean, we sometimes we can't resist doing that. Um, the best way and to really maximize all the things that the Enneagram has to offer us is to, you know, have a starting point, but to hold that information loosely until you have really done some good work on inner observer. Because the point is we want to really uncover those patterns that have been with us for a long time, when we are in our patterns, we really just can't see things as clearly as we could, you know? So I just want to make sure that, you know, the assessments are great, but, you know, don't stop there, right? Yeah. And I appreciate you saying that because I, I think I took one of these tests when I was in high school. I can't remember if they, if I was made to do that. But whenever I took it when I was young, I was like 15 or 16, I got it. I can't remember what I got, but it was different than the most recent mm-hmm. time that I took an assessment. And, and, uh, you know, I don't know if that's common. I'm not sure. But anyways, what you're saying is, is I think very valuable because that's kind of what I did. I went in, I, I spent a couple of days like reading about what the Enneagram was learning each type learning about security points and stress points and, and, and the wing types and things like that. And I think going into it with a little bit more understanding of uh, what it is and, and all of the possibilities, it was easier for me to, when I did take the assessment, actually think, because there was times when I would catch myself like, oh, that's just how you want to be, but that's not how you are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, again, I just, I think I appreciate you saying, saying that because it is important. Yeah. And so much is happening in our unconscious too. A lot of our pattern behavior is just happening so many levels down that when we're not in a healthy place, we we can't see it. The people around us can see it more than likely. You know, they can certainly get a, an energetic read on maybe anger, resentment, things like that. But, um, but yeah, that uncovering is really one of the best parts of the journey. And, and especially it really, it sets us up for actually, you know, growing you know, which is the point, you know, in my mind here, (laughs) I'm not that interested in just talking typology. I want to talk about what do we do with it? Now that we know these things about ourselves, you know, what do we do? Right. That's, that's where the good stuff happens. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Why, you know, what do you do after you start? I feel like what you're saying is, is something that I think about often where it's like, this is the starting point. Like you, this is a, a good model to, to, 
to have me look inward and, and I'm trying to uncover, but what does that journey actually look like? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, the, the place I think would be good to start is to talk about just health in general and what's often referred to is the levels of integration, levels of health in the Enneagram model. This is something that um, I think is best presented by uh, Russ Hudson um, in the wisdom of the Enneagram, which is kind of like the gold standard, more textbook almost for um, the Enneagram. But he has taken, so imagine sort of a, a you know, a, a hierarchy of things where we have at level one, and we'll use type one because you and I are both familiar with type one. So we'll sort of use that type as an example. But imagine level one within uh, the gifts of type one, which are, as you mentioned, like you, you, you have this innate ability to see the potential in everything. You can see when you're working with a client at the gym, you probably can naturally see the best version of that person, right? I imagine that's your gift. So, you know, up here, you know, when we're operating at level one is when we are really healthy, we are open, we are curious, we are not efforting who we are, we have this, this sense that everything is actually perfect as it is, and we don't have to try. And so levels one through three are what we would consider healthy um, awake. And then as we drop down in the levels, we start to sort of fall asleep to our gifts and our ego takes over. And then we start to really double down on perfectionism. We can get really judgmental, overly critical. And then it just, it just gets worse and worse. And so that line of health you know, in any given day, you can be, you can wake up at level three, you know, and you're like doing pretty good. And, you know, the world is your oyster, right? And all people are good. And I'm going to just do what I can to help out. But then something happens and then you fall down to level six and you're in judgment and you're, you know, it's like, ah, and resentment. And like, I, why am I working so hard? And everybody's slacking off, you know, which was definitely, you know, I think so, an uncovering for me where I was just tired of, bearing all the responsibility for everything, right? So so that's the first invitation is for us to really examine, you know, where are we showing up on that level of health on any given day? You know, where are we kind of residing most often? Um, levels one through three, we're doing pretty good. Four, five, six is where we're kind of on autopilot. We're in our patterns. Maybe we're not even aware of it. That's where most people tend to reside. And then when we're in seven, eight, nine is when we are suffering, we are in pain, we're acting out, you know, we're lashing out at people. I mean, I think we see a lot of that happening in the world right now because of fear, because of all of our driving emotions that maybe we, we aren't quite in touch with. So that's the first invitation is to really understand, am I, am I a healthy version of type one or six or whatever it is? Um, and then to, to, to understand what it looks like to move up even a level, which a lot of times is just a little bit of a loosening. I think what I love about the Enneagram is not asking us to do this heavy lift of becoming something else. It's just inviting us to just, you know, take our hands a little like that white knuckled grip on the, on the steering wheel, just like loosen, loosen it up a little bit. So, um, so that's one of the first, I think, really good opportunities to continue the work is to be constantly checking yourself on that level. You know, where am I showing up? And if I'm if I've been doing a lot of good work and I've been showing up maybe at level three and I've spent two or three weeks at, you know, a lower level, like what's what's going on? Like what's happening in my world? You know, paying more attention to that. What what is what's trying to get my attention, if that makes sense? Do you find that those levels are helpful because I, I know you described that was a good analogy of loosening your hands on the steering wheel. That's obviously some level of acceptance, but it's for me, what is helpful in that model is this is the type of thing that I am. And at my best, this is what I can do for people. And at my worst, this is what damage I could cause. 
Uh, and I think Absolutely. seeing that is helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, you have to look at it and you have to, there needs to be some level of honesty with yourself. So it's a slow, gentle entry point, you know, and over time, you know, being, being more honest is, uh, is, is the way, you know, and working with those parts of ourself that it's like, oh, I really don't like that part of me. Well, don't banish that part of you. Pay attention to what that part of you is telling you. Do you need more sleep? You know, are you in the wrong job? You know, do you have some toxic relationships that are sort of fueling that part of you that, you know, is just needing some nurture, right? Let's talk about what are the three centers of intelligence? I'm curious about this. This is the one thing that I wasn't quite sure about. Sure. Yeah. So the three centers of intelligence is sort of the first pass of the of the diagram. So um, there are three centers of intelligence. There are uh, the body types, which are types eight, nine, one. And um, the center is really about where we just innately, how we take in information from the world. So we have our body types, 891, and then we have our heart types, types 2, 3, and 4, and then our head types, uh, uh, 5, 6, and 7. So we have um, awareness in all three centers, but one tends to be dominant. So it's just an innate taking in of information. It's just how we navigate. So body types are taking in information just quickly, instinctually, in more of that gut center, sort of that like, I just know, don't ask me for details, right? And then we have our heart types that are just really, it's like this, just they can walk into a room and just naturally know if someone's off, if some how things are feeling, right? And then we have our, our head center, which is really that sort of analytical you know, truly taking in through as much information as can be gathered as quickly as possible. So that's sort of the first pass of what the centers of intelligence do. There, uh, the main theory is that we have a dominant center, and then we have a secondary center that supports the dominant center. And then typically there is a center that requires a little bit of work on our part to be in, in balance and harmony. So each type has sort of a, a, a different repressed center, if you will. It can get a little bit confusing because, for example, um, for type ones in the body center, uh, we take in information through that kinesthetic knowing. Um, but um, we are um, actually um, thinking repressed, right? So we tend to spend a lot of time in our heads. So we might think we're a head center. But actually, if you really drill down on our thinking when we're in an unhealthy level, most of our thinking is perhaps unproductive, right? So you have um, a lot of inner critic happening as a type one, you know, and so you're kind of smiling. So I'm wondering if you can relate to that, <laughs> but there's a lot of like unproductive chatter going on there, you know, but for a long time, I thought, well, I don't really relate to myself as a body type. That's because, you know, I, I'm like, I'm always in my head. Um, so it can be a little bit confusing, but, well, when you but said I also that... know, you know, I, t I do like, I kind of just know the right, the right next move. Right. Yeah. Well, when you said that, I was like, oh, I'm about to prove her wrong. Like this is wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, for exactly what you just described, because I'm like, I live my entire life <clears throat> inside my head, but right. it's very um, unproductive, as you describe. Mm -hmm. Something that I struggle with because of that is <clears throat> I've heard somebody else describe it in like a productivity sense of when you're trying to schedule your day. A lot of people struggle with the transitions. So it's like, you know, you finish your work and you got to go to your workout, just go right to your workout. Um, Instead of instead of waiting, I usually get caught up in my head when I'm when I'm trying to do something. It's it's that what you're describing. It's like unproductive thoughts usually um, prevent me from taking action or doing whatever. But what you describe to me is also true because I've said this before to people. I don't know if I've ever said this on the show, but the gut feeling I've never in my life gone with my gut and been wrong about anything. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think about that a lot now, and I didn't really recognize that this was so tied into um, the Enneagram, which is cool to know. But that's a very – that's a guiding force for me now. I'm like, this is the right thing to do. Let's do it. And uh, 
I still have a lot of life life left to live, I hope, but I would imagine that it will continue to be something that I rely heavily on um, throughout the rest of my life. Yeah, for sure. And it is a gift. You know, our, our dominant center is, it's a, it's a great skill. It serves us well. Um, but I also think there's an invitation to make sure that we are living in a balanced way. I um, would agree that most of the time my gut has served me well, but I can think of times where there was a cost maybe to not considering uh, a more emotional uh, landscape of what the impact might have on others. Um, and I can certainly come up with times where, you know, a little bit more information <laughs> might have yielded a, a, a fuller, better answer, too. So I think it's always it's just again, it's another invitation to just keep ourselves in check to um, try to look for a more whole way of navigating. Right. Yeah. Could you describe the secondary uh, type? I, I think I guess for type one, it would be the heart type. Is that correct? How does that play? Right into all of this. Right. So usually the, um, the heart is, um, you know, the secondary is just supporting our actions. So we would probably be inclined to do, you know, and check a feeling and then yes, good, go. Um, it's really our thinking that can trip us up. So usually that it's the repressed center that kind of hijacks us from like just really doing good stuff and, and, you know, being in balance. Um, so it just suggests that, um, that's, you know, your, your, your gut tells you, you might have a quick, like, are we good? And then you move into, into the right action. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Something else that I made me think of, and, and I'm not sure if this applies, but something that's very important to me, um, in my personality is fairness. Um, mm -hmm. and I feel like when we're, when I'm thinking about my heart, it's, it's always usually comes in when uh, for what you described, I recognize that like a feeling or a gut or a decision will affect others negatively. It almost pulls me back mm -hmm. like, oh, this is going to benefit me, but it's not going to benefit others. We can't do this. Or it, it's almost like a moral thing. Mm -hmm. Is that is that mm -hmm. a correct assumption? Yeah, yeah, that that would be a good example. And I think that also um, probably gets at some wing activity, which, uh, you know, we definitely want to talk about that. But before we move over into the wings, because that makes me think that that's your influence of type two, which would be on one side of one one wing where it's just that attention for the needs of others, right, taking care of others. Um, but before we go there, I think another thing I want to share about the centers of intelligence, e each center also has a driving emotion that, uh, and often this emotion can be very buried and operating in our subconscious. So for the body types, the emotion is anger. For the heart types, the emotion is often shame, guilt. And then for the head types, the, the emotion is fear. This is a very important part of um, the teaching and the uncovering in the Enneagram system because that emotion is driving so much of our activity. It's like what our, where our attention goes, our energy follows is something that you'll often hear in Enneagram workshops and whatnot. Um, you know, understanding my anger as a type one was a really crazy journey because I, I, it was really buried deep for me. I, I could relate to things like disappointment, frustration, irritation. That was very familiar to me. And because of, um, as you say, the, the orientation of a type one for fairness and also the orientation of good and bad and right and wrong, you know, those emotions, I would just want to kind of put them away because that's bad. I mean, I don't want to be a frustrated, irritated person. But the reality is that the people in my orbit, when I was operating at a more unhealthy level, I mean, they for sure knew that I was angry. You know, it was just unknown to me, right? It was, it was very deep because of my, you know, my just tendency and patterns to just wanting to be good and right. And like the best that I can be and, you know, trying to perfect everything. So, um, so really, um, starting to uncover the emotional landscape inside of us from our types perspective is um, the hardest, probably part of the, the work, but also I think where the real benefits start to come when you can be honest with yourself about 
um, what's really happening there, you know, especially, you know, in the context of relationships. Yeah. I think that uncovering some of the darker parts of myself have been the most revealing. Like you, like you say that I very much relate with that, the anger, frustration, disappointment. I'm, I'm, you can't say anything to me that I haven't thought horribly about myself in terms of like criticism that you could give. I probably tell Cayman after every episode, I'm like, I did horrible. That sucked. I got to, I got to improve next time. Uh, yeah, and I think I'm familiar. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it, it just to, to bring up the, the, the numbers uh, that you described earlier for each type, I think it also is important to recognize that those negative qualities that we tend to gravitate towards also make us who we are. And so that also makes the positive things that are really beautiful to see uh, play out in the world when we, when we are in a good space and we can see the good in people, um, you know, we, we wouldn't have those abilities if we also did not have uh, the negative things. Not to say that you should just leave your anger unaddressed and go, <laughs> go into the world, but um, you get my point. It's, it's always two sides of the same coin. Right. Well, we have a tendency to attach a morality to our emotions and they just are, you know, and they are a signal to us and we should pay attention. It's what we do with our emotions next. And when you are honest with yourself and you've done some work and you give yourself some nurture and especially for type ones that have that strong inner critic to reestablish a different kind of relationship with your inner critic, where you have a little grace for yourself, um, you're in a much better situation to manage those emotions effectively. I like that a lot. We attach our, we attach morality to our emotions. I've never really heard that perspective perspective before in that. uh, That is very true. Yeah. Anything else on uh, the centers of intelligence? No, I think that's good. I think um, so that's, you know, so we have the levels of integration and then we have the centers of intelligence. And um, so those being two really important um, layers uncovering opportunities. Yeah. Talk to me about wing types. Right. So here's our other opportunity to, to sort of balance ourselves out. So for every type, the numbers on either side of that type are considered the wing points. I do like to think of them as resources and also something to pay attention to because uh, we c- it's about balance. You know, we can tend to lean a little bit too far this way or that way. And if we're trying to work to become a more whole and authentic person and have better relationships, better connections, we want to be balanced, open, curious. And so um, for myself, I would call myself a type one with a two wing. It is why I uh, do the work that I do. It is why I put so much of an investment in the professional development of my employees. Um, I am a helper at heart. Um, sometimes I come at it from my type oneness, which can be hard charging and this is the right way, <laughs> you know, but at the core, it is that sort of caregiver nurturer in me, which is the gift of type two. Now, um, I have also experienced where there are parts of my life where that tendency towards helping can be a, a little bit smothering and a little bit, um, what is it they say, like, uh, you know, unsolicited advice is actually criticism in disguise, you know, so there's, you know, again, it's like type two, same thing, the healthy version of type two, I, am I entering type two space is an unhealthy two or is a healthy two? All those same rules apply, right? So I can get too carried away there. And so if I am aware of the resources available to me over in type nine, which is uh, our peacemaker, our mediator, they have this beautiful gift of seeing all sides. Um, that helps me balance out my uh, unhealthy type one pattern of just knowing my right way. Uh, but maybe other people have lots of good ideas, right? So that kind of helps me balance out the maybe the more defended, unhealthy versions of me, right? That I, that can just get carried away if I'm not paying attention. Does that help? Yeah, that's helpful. This is actually the wing types are. I obviously was looking into it. I just I think understood it a little bit um, less fully than some of the other concepts, but. I deduced when I was looking at it that I lean a little bit more towards type nine. Um, uh-huh. 
and I and I kind of came across this because <laughs> the thing you're talking about, where like I I'm very good at thinking about other people's opinions, um, which is is a good quality that you know, shuts off that thing of like, this is the one right way. Right. I don't, I don't believe Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. However, it leads to a lot of indecision in my life because Mm -hmm. I'm constantly just like, well, nobody knows what they're doing. So, you know, let, let's not do it. You know, what are we, what can we do? Right. Right. And it's interesting. If we go back to the centers of intelligence type nine in the, in the body center, but they are actually doing repressed, which is tricky too, because where the ones are thinking repressed, the nines are taking in information at the gut level, but they're just choosing not to really do anything with it. So they can be kind of stuck in inaction because they're just wanting to go along with everybody's ideas. So, you know, again, the gifts and then the challenges on that sort of spectrum. But but you also are like pulling that in and helping manage some of your your defense mechanisms that can operate as a type one. So I think that's the point is just like pulling in those resources, having enough awareness there of what's going on in those types. I understand too, that you generally lean more towards one. Um, is that always the case? Uh, do you, do you demonstrate qualities of both all the time? Is it different for each person? Tell me about that. Yeah, well, um, the the theory that keeps presenting itself, and I think it was Father Richard Rohr, I'm not sure if you are familiar with him, he's a Jesuit priest um, that, um, you know, grabbed the Enneagram and did really good work with it in early days. Um, he has a theory that I, I think is certainly playing out for myself, which is that in the first half of our life, we tend to lean more towards one wing. And then in the in the second part of our life, we we tend to incorporate more of the other wing. So I think it's just like, I don't know, you might theorize that it's just like life kicking you around enough that you're like, okay, I'm going (laughs) to just, you know, go into surrender and acceptance. And maybe that just naturally brings us more in balance. Right. But, um, but usually people can identify pretty quickly with more one or the other. You know what that made me think of is, like I said, I I definitely gravitate more towards nine, which is the mediator and 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 all the things that you described before. And I've almost always said, like, I love to help people too, for a lot of the same reasons why you described. I love I'm a I'm a fitness coach. I also help with coaches development. So I develop our other coaches at the gym. And I've always said as I get older and I have more resources available to me to like help other people. You know, like, like I'm currently in a phase in my life where I'm still trying to figure things out and, and make sure that I survive and, and things like that. <laughs> um, and I've always said that as I get more resources, I, I always felt I would gravitate more towards that stuff. Um, and so I don't know if that has, if that jogs anything in your mind, but um, it's interesting that it, that yeah. it shifts and that is a, and that is a, a model. Yeah. Well, I guess I, I, I first think of just the, the type nines gift of just bringing people together for a common cause too. So you're wanting to just like the train, the trainer, just to have a bigger ripple effect. Um, you know, that makes sense to me that that's more of the, <clears throat> the nine stuff. Um, I am curious. It, uh, I would want to know, like if you, if we were in a coaching environment, I would want to know like how conflict shows up for you, you know, in, cause that might be a distinction between a, one with a nine wing and a one with a two wing is that there might be a little bit more of an aversion to conflict because what the nine is always striving for above anything else is just peace and harmony. Right. Uh, Sometimes to a cost because we know when we avoid conflict, we just generally create more conflict and it's even worse than when we started. Uh, But that would be something I would be curious about in the distinction between the two. I hate conflict. I mean, I, uh, you know, (laughs) It's a, I always just assumed it's because I was very shy when I was growing up and, and maybe that is one of the, also the underlying reasons too, but um, yeah. yeah, I don't, I have to willingly, like in the leadership positions that I, that I'm in, I have to like talk myself up in the mirror, like, okay, man, you're going to have this conversation. And then like weeks go by before I finally, <laughs> before I finally yeah. am able to do it. Yeah, that sounds a lot like type nine stuff there. Um, I, on the other hand, uh, in my oneness in my early days, would have probably chased someone down to get the conflict dealt with. (laughs) That's not a good strategy either, I should say. (laughs) Yeah. Um, 
anything else on wing points that you'd like to throw in before we no i think that i think that that kind of sums that up yeah the the things that really piqued my interest when i was learning were the stress and the security type so so let's talk about that what are each one of those sure yeah so i um so each type has a line that takes you to a a type that uh, sort of em- you can tend to embody in times of stress and then consequently uh, a type that you can find a lot of resource in that's like when you really are in your healthiest manifestation of self. So to put some example to that, um, and I I like to describe this as like you go to your stress type to to really find the parts of yourself that really need some healing and nurture sort of those shadow parts in order to really just work through the hard stuff to allow yourself to then start to integrate that other type, which is your growth type. So for me, how that has played out and the one in stress uh, gravitates towards type four, which is the romantic or the individualist. Um, the gifts of that type are the capacity for emotions um, they have a great capacity to hold even dark emotions. They have this amazing gift of seeing beauty in the world, often uh, very creative types. Um, and I have a, just a real fondness for that type in particular. Um, all the types, but that one, something about it just really gets into my heart. And it's probably a part of me that what that just needs love and nurture, right? And so what would happen is that I would be just in lower levels of health as type one, just grinding it out, trying to make everything exactly how it's supposed to be, which is exhausting work, Um, deep in, you know, just judgment and over-responsibility. And then when it became just too much, I would adopt the characteristics of of an unhealthier version of a type four. And what that looks like is a lot of emotionality uh, can be um, fairly dark. And so for the people around me, you know, I, I would just fall apart and they didn't understand what was happening. I didn't understand what was happening. I felt like I was horribly flawed. There's something wrong with me. I'm broken. Um, but I, when I started to learn the Enneagram and I, I learned about that movement that that represented like the scariest part of me. But when I learned that, could that be as simple as that that's just what happens to me when things get that hard? And when I allowed myself to consider that it is just that part of me that needs some attention, then it just, everything opened up and I, I could start to nurture that part of myself. I gave myself the space for that. I started to take care of better, better care of myself. And how the integration of that part of me, how that works is that I think of that as the place that I went to where now I can actually notice the beautiful flowers when I'm on a walk. And that sounds corny, but like in my patterned one, just go, 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 I think I blew past a lot of beautiful parts of life, right? Because I was just in my patterned state. But after spending time in that place, now it's like it opened up this whole other part of me and I I can actually take in the beauty of that type. And now I am in a better place to start to embody the characteristics of type seven, which is my growth type, your growth type as a type one, uh, which is the adventurer, the epicure, uh, positivity. Um, They're really just going through life, just just all the opportunities of life, all the things, all the possibilities. It's just a a beautiful gift of of the type seven. So like that's the almost like the last stop on the station of trying to like be whole, you know, is how I see it. I don't, I know we've been talking about, I guess it's convenient that you and I are both type ones and we've been able to have this conversation sort of off. I don't understand or haven't looked deeply enough into the other types um, to quite know if this is true, but I feel like for one at least, and you can confirm the others, that it seems it, like if you if you're not if you're not careful, it can be a bit cyclical. And I wouldn't say that I do this anymore. With a lot of self work that I've done over the past couple of years, I feel like I'm 
usually, you know, in a pretty good place. But I tend to think that before I would work super hard, tunnel vision, focus at a specific thing. And then I would accomplish said thing, feeling so good about myself, I would sort of move to this uh, security type, which is type seven. And then I would just kind of indulge like I'm, for example, I've run a couple ultra marathons. Uh, and the most recent one I did was a hundred miles. And afterwards it was just like weeks of me living in this glorious world where I had a, not a care in the world. I had just did my grand adventure. Um, I was satisfied with my effort. And because of that, I took a back seat on a lot of the things that make me feel good, which is like a very structured discipline, not over extravagant um, routine oriented life. And mm -hmm. then it pushed me because I was in that for too long to this stressful time where like you described, you, you have these dark thoughts and feelings. Um, my experience currently isn't going to be enough. If only I could uh, stop and smell the roses more than, more than I do, I would finally be happy sort of feeling. But mm -hmm. I guess that's a double barreled question is that cyclical thing that I just described common? And is it also common with other types as well? I think it's, I think it is the story of our humanity that we have to practice all of these things. And the more we practice, the easier it is to get back to that balanced state. And, um, you know, I think I, I just always say it's, it's the most important thing is catching yourself in the act of what you describe, which is like, okay, I'm a little off balance here. You know, I can see the movements, I can see my patterns, and now I'm here. And so what I know that's good for me is to get back to a, a more balanced state. So it's catching ourselves in the act. Um, there is a, a teaching in the Enneagram that I think is very helpful for this to, to keep it as a practice. And it's called the five A's. And it's very similar to what you might hear in like, I think it's like a 12 step program, but it sort of goes like this you know, the first A is awareness. So we've learned all of these things about ourself, about the other types, which has brought us a lot of compassion for ourself and also others. So we have this awareness. And then we have um, acceptance because we've come to this place where we understand enough about ourselves and the world to say like, we can't control everything. We, we have learned to just sort of be with what is for the most part, and that's the second A. So awareness, acceptance. And then we have appreciation, which I think is just such an important A, which is just that moment of gratitude for like all the things that I've learned and that I've been working for and the capacity that I have opened for myself and in my relationship with others. And then we have action, which is that sort of catching yourself and like, okay, I know these things. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make a different action here based on all of those things, right? So um, so then we have the last A, which is really getting at what you're saying, which is adherence. And that just simply means that we are committing to making all of those steps of practice and keeping ourselves from spending too much time in, you know, indulgence or, you know, whatever it is that we know and we've learned is just not uh, a great place to stay. It's good for a weekend, right? But maybe not for a lifetime, you know? So I find that to be a very helpful uh, process for people once they've learned the lines and the wings and the uh, levels of integration that, you know, you've got all this information, and so this is what, this is sort of the process we have to put it through to keep it fresh, keep ourselves in the space. Why do you think it's so important for people to understand this whole picture in its entirety? Like what, what is the benefit of seeing this is who I am and all the parts of myself and, and where I go when I do this and where I go when I do that? What, what's the benefit? Well, for me and for many people I've worked with, the benefit is a decrease in anxiety, um, more of an access to joy, deeper, more meaningful connections to people. I, I think what shows up in every engagement that I have is that people are really ultimately looking for the same things, which is feeling worthy, 
having love, being able to receive love. And it just, it sometimes takes a lot of uncovering to get to the place where you you really come to terms with that. Um, you know, I, I, I see, I, it's what I'm seeing most often right now is sort of this general malaise. You know, people mm-hmm. are showing up and they're like, I just don't feel right. I can't put my finger on it, but I'm just kind of blah, you know? And then some people come because the wheels of life have come completely off. But a lot of times it's just that sort of general malaise, you know, and, and people are exhausted. And so once you uncover, it really comes down to, to that, you know, am I enough? You know, we are, I feel like we're living in what I've been calling like, um, an epidemic of grandiosity, you know, we are constantly bombarded with messages that whatever we've been working for is not enough, whatever we've obtained is not enough. And, you know, and so we're just, you know, most people have this like hole and they're, they're not even really aware of the hole, but they're just trying to fill the hole and they're just doing their thing. And then they, they, and then they're like, why am I feeling this way? You know? And so when you, so when you start to uncover, it's like, oh, I can stop doing all that. Or maybe I don't have to do as much of it. You know, it's like we have practical things we have to do, but, but there's like this lightness that can come, this freedom, right? And, uh, and then just, you know, better everything, really. Touching on that and its impact, I'm curious with, with a career of coaching people and, and businesses with this, what are some of these overarching things that you see, maybe, maybe perhaps outside of that? Like what, what are the things that you've learned from working with people on it? I have learned um, how much difficulty we have with our emotions and how um, cutting off our emotions and putting our emotions away, how we never quite complete the cycle of healing, you know, whatever, like those early wounds, which we all have. Um, And so I think, I think it's really interesting when you just invite people to just we, we have to teach a lot of people just to be able to sit quietly for a minute and breathe, you know, telling a person that's really super busy just they need to meditate is often not very helpful. <laughs> you know, it's like, it doesn't just work that way. So, but I find that maybe after the third time or so, or just taking a, a moment to center and breathe a little bit, how often people are like, I kind of want to cry right now. Mm. You know, we just, it's like, we can't, handle emotions we're we're taught to like just put that away it's bad it's unproductive you know and so I think another thing I see is just uh just it's just but it comes up right you push it down but then it comes out sideways right and then it starts causing us problems in our relationships and at work and you know it's so I do see an awful lot of that yeah even when you were saying that I was like directing my thoughts more inward like checking in and I was I, I definitely feel as though I've been uh, I need, I need to take a little bit of time at some point, like it's got to happen soon, you know, mm-hmm. because I'm somebody who I feel like is very well practiced with mindfulness and right. I've done a bunch of stuff that has helped improve my ability to check internally with myself. If you told me to sit down and meditate, I think I could fall into it fairly easily. Um, uh, and I know that that's not, that's not a very common thing, but yeah, even somebody who who I, I give a lot of time and energy to thinking about these kinds of practices, I catch myself all the time of like, it's been a week since I've even thought about the idea of of checking in with myself really, really quickly, mm-hmm. because it, it takes, you just have to remember to do it. And it's so hard to right. remember to take a breath, check in with how you feel, slow down a second, be conscious of what's happening around you and who you are and how you're feeling. And if you're okay. And I think having these conversations, uh, it's just a great reminder of that. Right. And, and that's why they call it a practice because it requires practice and we fall off and then we remember and we get back on and we share what works for us with the understanding that maybe it won't work for this person, but they have to find their own formula, their own recipe. Um, but I think, you know, we're entering kind of the age of emotion, Right. You know, there's so much science now that suggests that, you know, our thinking brain is just the tiniest little part of the whole experience that's happening. You know, what's happening in our bodies is like just fascinating. You know, I um, I had to kind of find my body 
I was very disconnected from my body. I, you asked me how something was feeling in my body. And I'm like, I'm just like, a, like I'm like a, just a walking around head, you know? <laughs> so that took me a long time just to be able to actually, the somatic stuff, just to feel it. So it's, it's hard for a lot of people, you know, starting, you know, where, you know, it takes uh well, you work with people building muscles. A lot of this is just, we're trying to build up these muscles of our heart and the things that are happening in our body in order to take better care of ourselves. Yeah. I just recorded a, a solo episode right before we, we had this conversation and it was like a comprehensive, how to build your fitness in a very simple way for people who just hate the idea of having to exercise and eat well, move their bodies. They just hate it. And, uh, one of the most underlying principles that I tried to come across what, or get across was that this requires weeks and weeks and months and perhaps years of effort. And it's this thing that you have to toil with. And at times you feel like you're not improving, but you are, and you just have to think logically. I'm doing all of the things I know work. This is the same. Taking time for yourself regularly works. And if you don't feel like you're making any progress, it's likely that you're not looking at a big enough window and you need to be more consistent with it and stick it out because um, it's worked for so many people and it works, it works for everybody as long as you just keep at it. Right. Right. And celebrating the wins, right. Celebrating those accomplishments. Yeah. yeah. If yeah, people are sure. interested on more resources on the Enneagram, where would you point them to, to look into that? Yeah, so there's a couple of places um, I would suggest checking out the Narrative Enneagram. That is the, um, the, the place that I got my certification from many, many years ago. And um, the idea with the Narrative Enneagram is that we learn from each other through our stories. Um, and I think that's just a beautiful model uh, for that uncovering is when we share what's been going on with us, uh, with other people. And then there's also the Enneagram Institute is another really great one. Both of them are accredited programs through the International Enneagram Association and have a lot of great content just, um, just on the website poking around. Um, yeah, so maybe start there. And there's all kinds of books. Um, but I just know that those two uh, groups are sort of the... Um, uh, sort of the OG Enneagram people that um, very credentialed um, have done a lot of really amazing work and study. Yeah. I'll make sure to put both of those in the description and I'll even say the narrative Enneagram is where I, where I was looking. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's great because it's, it's very simple, uh, but you can, mm -hmm. you can dive pretty deep on some of the, the, com the, the topics rather. Um, yeah. Are there any other resources for you specifically? If people want to see more, are you putting out content on this? Can people reach out and, and, perhaps chat with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can reach me at, on my website, uh, northrivercoach.com. Also, I have an Instagram page as well that you can link through just from the website. So yeah, love to love to talk with whomever. Yeah, yeah cool. Whoever. I'll be sure to obviously include some of those too. But yeah, uh, Maria, you. is there anything else before we sign off that you think is worth adding? Oh, I think we could talk Enneagram for a long time, but I think we have hit sort of the high parts. Um, and, you know, it's a journey, right? It, it can become in and of itself a practice. Um, so it's not just a, a typology system. It's, it's so much more. Lots of gifts there. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really did enjoy this conversation. Um, I think it's going to yeah, be a super valuable one to have, and I hope people that listen to it enjoy it. But um, thanks yeah. for doing this, and we'll, we'll leave it right there. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode of Good People. Before we head out, if you guys are watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe and turn on our notifications so you don't miss our weekly Friday uploads. If while you're listening, you enjoyed, please share this episode with someone you love, perhaps your grandma. We'll see you next time.